The 3 Series is an incredibly important vehicle for BMW. Not only is it their best-selling sedan, but it's also an icon, a legend, and a benchmark. This is the vehicle by which practically every sedan in North America is constantly compared. You've probably read reviews out there saying something like, the Honda Accord is the BMW 3 Series of family sedans. Well, this is the BMW 3 Series. And for 2023, it's received a few important changes. Before we dive into the 3 Series itself, we should talk about what it means to be a benchmark. Benchmark is simply the standard by which other things are measured, and those things could be measured below or above that benchmark. And indeed, that is true with the BMW 3 Series as well. You will find entries in this segment that accelerate faster, that handle better, that are more reliable, that have a bigger back seat, that have a bigger trunk. Well, okay, not any that have a bigger trunk because this is the largest in the segment, but that is one of the few areas where the 3 Series is indeed best in class. What's interesting about the 3 Series and interesting about benchmark titles is that in order to maintain that benchmark status, the 3 Series has to be good at everything. It doesn't need to be the best at everything. Think of it sort of as the jack of all trades, the master of a few, but not necessarily everything. Or if you're a spider chart fan, think of this more as a circle rather than a really pointy star. Because oftentimes when you want to focus on handling, you give up ride quality. When you're focused on reliability, you give up innovation. I'm talking to you, Lexus IS. And that's not what's going on with the 3 Series, which is why it's always had a very special place in my heart. But again, not the best at everything. Not even the best in BMW sales. That would actually be the X3 and the X5. This is now the third best-selling BMW. The changes for this model year are mainly cosmetic on the outside and infotainment based on the inside. We don't see any substantive changes under the hood. But we do get new slimmer LED headlights, still instantly recognizable as a BMW. They are of course full LEDs, well integrated front parking sensors, a kidney grill that is certainly more demure than some of the more, uh, shall we say, expressive grills in the BMW lineup. And this one does feature active grill shutters in the 330i to help improve efficiency. Active grill shutters have two functions in a vehicle like this. They help improve aerodynamics and they help the vehicle warm up a little bit quicker in the winter. BMW goes about the active grill shutters a little bit different because they're visible on the surface. They're these little blanks right here between these uh, sort of tooth-like sections in the grill. Most manufacturers hide them away where you can't see them, but in this it really cleans up the lines when they're closed and then it allows that extra cooling when they're open. As we've seen from BMW for quite some time, there are tons of different ways to get your 3 Series. Big engine, little engine, plug, no plug. This particular one is the 330i rear wheel drive, so base drive train configuration, but it does have the M Sport package on it. So we get a tweaked front end design, unique wheels, and of course the blue brake calipers as well. You'll have to pardon the drops on your screen. It has been raining all day long and the heavens have decided to open yet again. Dimensionally, the 3 Series is right in the middle of the category at just under 186 inches long. That slots this below the tweeners, the Infiniti Q70 and the Cadillac CT5, and above the smaller entries in this segment like the Alpha Julia and the Lexus IS. Most notable for the 3 Series is, of course, this really long hood design, and that's because the 3 Series, as with most BMWs, was designed for their long inline six engine to live under the hood. That's what really gives this that very classic rear wheel drive proportion. Now, if you're shopping based on price, not on size, you will find some vehicles like an Acura TLX, etc., that are going to be bigger than this, but similarly priced. Now, vehicles like that TLX are interesting because it too has a long hood proportion, but that's just resulted in strange interior dimensions. Doesn't really give you that much more room than the 3 Series. Moving around to the rear, we find full LED taillight modules, including the turn signals, but they're not amber in North America. For some reason, they are black. We have the backup lights there on the trunk lid, dual exhaust tips down below, even though this is the base 330i model, and a subtle little sort of spoiler on top of the trunk lid. It's really more of a body-colored lip, I guess you'd say. 2023, BMW did not change anything under the hood because they didn't need to. This already has one of the best and certainly the most complete engine lineup in this segment. The base engine is a 2-liter 4-cylinder turbo producing 255 horsepower, 
294 pound-feet of torque, and when equipped with rear-wheel drive, as we're driving today, you'll get 29 miles per gallon combined. You can, of course, get BMW's famed inline-six engine in three different power levels. The 340i gives you 382 horsepower under this hood. The M3 jumps that up to 473 or 503 if you get the competition package. Or you could get your BMW 3 Series with a plug. That would be the 330e. If you want to know more about that drivetrain, there is a video on the channel that really still applies to that plug-in hybrid system. It gives you 288 horsepower thanks to an electric motor and a detuned version of this same 2-liter 4-cylinder turbo. There's also a 12 kilowatt hour battery on board, which won't give you quite as much EV range as some, but it's still definitely usable and, of course, still gives you that 288 horsepower combined. Unlike some of the competition, BMW offers all-wheel drive with every engine. The only exception is the regular version of the M3. You have to choose the M3 Competition in order to get all-wheel drive, but you can still get all-wheel drive with every engine in the lineup, including the plug-in hybrid system, and it is a true mechanical all-wheel drive, not an e-all-wheel drive axle like we find in some. After a week of mixed driving, I found the driver's seat to be very comfortable and very supportive, but I do think the seats in the S60 are just a little bit more comfortable for my body shape. We have a manual extending thigh cushion, power four-way lumbar support here, a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion, and we find the exact same range of motion on the passenger seat, including the four-way lumbar and the extending thigh cushion. But it doesn't have the two-position memory that we do find for the driver's seat. Jumping into the back of the 3 Series, it's important to remember this is a compact sedan, so there's certainly going to be some compromises. Headroom is pretty decent. It's among the best in this segment, and I think for my body shape, the way the headrest and the ceiling is laid out, this is the best for me. Sitting in a natural seating position here, my hair is brushing the ceiling. My head is maybe a quarter inch from the ceiling. If I put my head back to the headrest, then my head does touch the ceiling. Combined legroom wise, 77.2 inches in here. That puts this sort of middle of the pack, but the front seats move quite far rearward. Keep that in mind. If you're a taller driver or a taller passenger sitting up front, you're going to prefer the 3 Series because of how far that seat moves back. I had a six foot five person comfortably sitting up front. The seat was moved further forward, but I have now put it in the all the way rearward position to show you that if I were to do that, there's really no way to sit behind this seat. It's only about two inches from the seat bottom cushion, so you really couldn't sit behind a seat in that position. Also, the middle seat is going to be a little tight in here because we have a pretty big hump. This is a rear wheel drive vehicle, so that drive shaft has to go somewhere. And keep in mind, again, compact sedan, so the rear bench is not going to be as wide as the next category up. Or something like a Camry or an Accord, which you might be sort of cross-shopping with a 3 Series. I know that sounds weird, but I do know a decent number of people that are really torn between getting something mainstream and larger for a similar price tag or getting a base BMW 3 Series, and this is one of the considerations that you have to keep in mind. You are going to be giving up interior room for the extra luxury, the extra refinement, and of course the extra performance ability. The 3 Series also sports a surprisingly large trunk. Depending on the measurement you're looking at, this has ranged from 15 cubic feet up to 17 cubic feet. BMW currently says it is 16.9 cubic feet. Two important things to remember, there are different measurement standards for trunk volume. There's an SAE version, there's an EPA version, there's also a European version for measuring trunk volume. None of that matters too much. This is still a very large and accommodating trunk, and one of the largest, if not the largest in the segment, depending on exactly how you're measuring it. It is also nice and square. It is a bit more of a slot-style glove compartment, but it's very boxy and upright. You cannot put a roller bag in this position, a 22-inch roller bag, and still close the trunk lid, but it is kind of close. So if you had roller bags that were a little bit smaller than this, you might be just fine. Now keep in mind that one of the ways BMW gives us that big trunk is by not giving us a spare tire under the floor. And lastly, if you're looking at the plug-in hybrid, the trunk does shrink. It goes from 16.9 cubic feet down to 13.2 cubic feet because the battery has to live somewhere, and that somewhere is the trunk. Arguably, the biggest change for 2023 happens inside, where we find BMW's latest iDrive software on the dashboard. But before we take a look at these two enormous screens, let's take a look at the rest of the interior. Moving up to the ceiling, we find the controls for the moonroof. It is not a panoramic design, although it is larger than average. BMW gives us extendable sun visors, but you'll notice that they're not wrapped in the same fabric as the ceiling. Pardon the spots here, those are just the water spots right there on the moonroof. This is plastic instead of fabric like the ceiling is wrapped in, so it's a little bit different in some of the competition. We have 
fixed height shoulder belts and four-way adjustable headrests for the driver and front passenger. This upholstery is sort of a light saddle brown color. We have perforations in the seat bottom and seat back cushion center sections, although these seats in this model are just heated. They're not also ventilated. You can see the manual extending thigh cushion there and fairly aggressive bolstering for a vehicle in this segment. If you're a larger driver, you might find these seats a little bit confining, but I found them to be just about perfect. Moving over to the front doors, lots of soft touch and premium materials happen up top, and then down lower on the door, we find harder plastics, mainly coated in a rubbery coating to make it look more premium and visually match what's going on up top, but still retain the durability of a harder plastic. Moving over to the dashboard, this is where we find the majority of the changes. The side portion of the dash, that's very similar to before. We find wood trim in this particular model, obviously different trims available in different uh, versions of the vehicle. Pretty decently sized bin style glove compartment there. I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. You can see the ambient light strip running right there under that metallic section. So we have real wood, this metallic strip, ambient lighting, and then soft touch dash components hard plastics lower there on the dashboard. And then moving back to the center here, we have an absolutely enormous infotainment screen. This is nearly 15 inches. It kind of hovers over the dashboard. There's like a little support strut there, and then you can put your fingers around that so this molded dashboard component stretches behind that and underneath it. It supports full screen, well, almost full screen Apple CarPlay integration. You can see that there's a home button here, and then the climate buttons stay there on the bottom. And that's because we no longer find physical controls for most of the climate control functions, although we do have Max Defrost and Defogger down there, and then some physical controls for the infotainment system over here, a volume and power knob, uh, and then we find track forward, backward, but everything else is going on in this absolutely enormous screen in the dashboard. There's the native main menu, which gives you little snippets of things like navigation, CarPlay, telephone, personal assistant, etc. You can also get an app view where you click that button, and then we get each app sort of like on a smartphone or a tablet. As you can see, this supports Android Auto in addition to Apple CarPlay, and there are also some integrated infotainment apps. Uh, you can also direct access to certain apps on your device. So for instance, a better route planner, it just pops up right there on here. I don't pay for that premium feature in ABRP, so I don't have that particular one, but that gives you an idea of what's going on. Now, if you have navigation on the Apple Maps on your Apple iPhone, then we also get a duplicate map over here on the instrument cluster, which is a really, really cool feature. This is one of the very few vehicles in the world that supports dual screen CarPlay, something that Apple has supported for a while, but car manufacturers have not. So you can see your navigation map over here and do something else with this display like infotainment. The funny thing about this version of iDrive is that the infotainment screen being so enormous actually makes this 12.3 inch instrument cluster seem just a tiny bit small. This also has a full color heads up display and you can use from a number of different layouts for this screen here. So you can choose, you know, a G display there in the middle. You can also choose your typical media information trip computer information, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions from the factory navigation or the Apple CarPlay interface, depending on what you want to do. Uh, you can also move over here and choose from a few different layouts, depending on how you want the screen to be arranged. And all of these layouts can be combined with the Apple CarPlay information. So for instance, in this display, we get the largest version of the secondary map over here with everything else being minimized over here on this side and then some additional information running down there at the bottom. The steering wheel is very similar to before. It's a round three spoke design. We have large paddle shifters on the back. They have a little rubbery accent on the back as well, down on the left, up over here on the right. You'll find infotainment controls over here on this side as well as the controls for that multifunction instrument cluster and then the controls for the cruise control over here on the left, heated steering wheel button right there in the middle. No BMW would be complete without excellent driving dynamics. This generation is no different. What BMW is really, really good at is tuning the drivetrain. The power delivery from the engine, making that power delivery feel absolutely effortless, the smoothness of it, the smoothness of the transmission shifts, etc. This is where BMW has really spent their money. It's worth noting that this ZF 8-speed automatic transmission is used in a wide variety of the competition, but in this vehicle, BMW's software is why it feels the way that it does. And then, of course, we have the engine. BMW is famous for underrating their engines. I have no reason to suspect that this engine is any different. It's probably producing more than 255 horsepower thanks to its relatively quick 0 to 60 run of 5.4 seconds. Now you can get 0 to 60 a little bit faster. If you choose the all-wheel drive version of the 330i, it is definitely going to be quicker because traction is very important when we're talking about acceleration. Really, without exception, 
the all wheel drive versions of the three series are going to be faster than the rear wheel drive versions, but they're not necessarily going to be more fun. And that's obviously one reason to buy the three series is the amount of fun we can have here. It's not just about zero to 60, it's about the excellent braking scores. 112 feet in this model, even in damp conditions like we're driving on right now, that's a really excellent stopping distance. And the dynamics of the handling ability of this vehicle. It's not about absolute grip, it's about precision in the three series. If you want to grip the road better, something like the Alfa Romeo Giulia, I think it does handle a little bit better, especially when we're talking about base model to base model. It's also gonna have a bit more power, it's pretty darn swift but it's not gonna feel as well sorted, as well balanced as the three series. And some people might mean that that's talking about weight balance in the vehicle front versus rear. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how all the systems behave together in this car. Uh, the weight of the steering, the steering ratio, the way the transmission and the engine respond, the fact that the transmission is almost always in the right gear. It's practically psychic when it comes to its software programming. This is the kind of vehicle that's very easy and very fun to drive in a spirited manner and then can really hold its own if you want to drive even more aggressively, but also makes you feel like a star if you just put this in the more comfortable mode and you're driving down your favorite winding mountain road to work. But again, Benchmark is not about being absolute best in segment. So even though I'm going to give this an A when it comes to handling, that doesn't mean that this is the best handling vehicle in the segment. Depending on whether you want to consider a CT4 or a CT5 the natural competitor to this, both of them have excellent driving dynamics in vehicles that are relatively comparably priced to this. Some may be a little bit better. Also, I think the now gone Jaguar XE really excelled when it came to handling ability, as does the Alfa Romeo Giulia but there are compromises. They're not gonna be as well behaved on rougher roads. They're not gonna be as comfortable. They're not gonna be as fuel efficient, etc. Something that I think a lot of folks don't appreciate is that designing a well-balanced vehicle like this is more difficult than designing a one-trick pony. If you want your vehicle to be the fastest in the segment, you jam a big engine under the hood, make it the most powerful, etc. And that's all that's really required. Just take a look at a Hellcat from Dodge, for instance. But you're gonna be giving up a lot if that's all that you've focused on. And to some extent, I would say that some of the really fast Cadillacs fall into that category. If you wanna make something the most comfortable, you give it the most suspension travel, give it very compliant springs, give it an air suspension, etc. But you're gonna give up handling ability and you may compromise other aspects of vehicle performance. BMW takes all of those things into consideration and says we want to be 9 out of 10 or 9.5 out of 10 in every category rather than necessarily targeting 10 out of 10 in any specific category. Although, obviously, the BMW M3 is absolutely excellent when it comes to handling and acceleration. But keep in mind that the focus of the 3 Series is really a bit more complicated than that. It's to try and have everything at an elevated level. And that's why this score is really well across the board. The 330i that I'm driving today has the optional adaptive dampers, and if I were to buy a 3 Series, I would definitely want this particular option. If you get the 3 Series without it, it can come across as a little bit too firm, especially out on rougher roads like this or on broken pavement. Freeway expansion joints especially can be a bit tiring if you don't choose the adaptive suspension. If you do, even in the 340i, the M Sport trims, etc., I think the suspension comes across as really well balanced. Now, there are going to be more comfortable options in this segment. I think the new Mercedes-Benz C-Class does excel when it comes to suspension comfort when properly equipped, and some of the bigger, heavier options are also going to be quite comfortable. The base version of the CT5, for instance, it definitely has a bigger feel, but it is, of course, a much bigger vehicle. On the outside, it's actually about the same size as a BMW 5 Series, although on the inside, it's much closer to this 3 Series in terms of its interior dimensions. Back out on the paved road, I measured 70 and a half decibels at 50 miles an hour. I mainly blame the tires for the cabin noise in this vehicle. I'm gonna give this a B plus because it does fall below a number of the key competition, especially the new Mercedes-Benz C-Class that is a bit quieter inside. As far as fuel economy goes, clearly you're gonna get the best fuel economy in the hybrid entries and plug-in hybrid entries in this segment. But as far as non-hybrid goes, this vehicle is excellent. It's EPA rated for 29 miles per gallon. Over a week of mixed driving, bearing in mind I go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass, I've been averaging 31 miles per gallon. This is definitely very, very efficient in addition to being one of the swifter entries. 
Now it's time for the final scores. Again, let me know what you think of the design of the 3 Series down there in the comments section, but I think it's more adventurous in a good way than what we see in the current generation C-Class or the Audi A4. And the Lexus IS is just a little bit too bizarre up front for my tastes. I do think I prefer the restrained and elegant styling of the Volvo S60, but by its sales, very few other people in the US seem to prefer that. And I do think the 3 Series looks better than the current generation Tesla Model 3, although we're probably going to see a Tesla Tesla update coming very soon. I think BMW has done a really great job with the engine lineup in the 3 Series also. I am a little bit surprised that it was the 4 Series Grand Coupe that got the full battery electric version, the BMW i4, rather than starting with the 3 Series, but who knows, maybe that's coming at some point soon. I even like BMW's iDrive 8. I think it's easier to use than the Mercedes m buck system, and it's a lot better feeling and better looking currently than what we see in the Audi lineup at present. The Lexus system, even though they're rolling out a new one, I think that iDrive really punches above its weight there as well. Everything together, the BMW is just a really great can't-go-wrong pick. If I had to pick things apart, though, there are a few things I would want to improve. I think the interior could be roomier. Rear seat headroom could be a little bit better. I wish the base model had maybe a little bit more power. There are some base alternatives that have a bit more oomph. Pricing also gets pretty spendy pretty quickly. Now, keep in mind that packaging a plug-in hybrid system in a rear-wheel drive-based vehicle like this is pretty tricky. BMW did a good job, but I wish they had taken things to the next level with that plug-in hybrid. With a pricing range that starts at $43,800 for a base 330i and stretches all the way up to $115,000 for a fully decked-out M3 competition, the pricing range on the 3 Series is enormous, and it seems like there's a 3 Series for everyone, just as you'd expect from a benchmark entry. Now, what's interesting about this pricing chart that you'll see on your screen screen is that the Mercedes-Benz C-Class is likely going to have a very similar pricing range, although we don't know pricing for the new C63 AMG that we all know is coming soon. It's probably going to be up there towards $115,000 or $120,000. Generally speaking, the Mercedes is a bit more expensive than the BMW, so expect that fully decked out model to actually beat the M3 on this chart. Not everybody wants to put the Model 3 in the luxury segment, but let's be real honest, it is a luxury sedan. Some Tesla fans say, no, it's the EV for the masses, and that's just not supported by the pricing range that you see on your screen. And some European luxury car fans say, well, they're just not members of the club because they're not luxury enough. Well, luxury is whatever it means to you. If you want to put them in the category, if you don't, I will leave that up to you. Some folks say that the Lexus IS doesn't belong in this category, nor does a Volvo S60. Again, I will leave that up to you. But price-wise, it is right there in line with lower-end and mid-level Model 3s. But price-wise, it is definitely right in there with lower-end 3 Series and mid-level 3 Series as well. So what are you going to get in a 3 Series and not in a Model 3 and vice versa? Well, clearly, the 3 Series is not all electric, but you could get a BMW i4 if you want one of those. Yeah, on a more basic level, however, it really comes down to the ability to customize, the paint options, the option packages, etc. If you're the kind of person that wants a specific wheel, and you want blue leather, and you want this, and you want that all together, you're going to find that in certain versions of the 3 Series, you will not find that in the Model 3. There are two interior colors, very limited exterior color palette, uh, very limited number of wheel options from the factory. If you want that factory thing that's customized for you, you're going to find that in the European options not in the Model 3. If you want that clean, modern look, you want a little bit of extra room inside, you want some of the practicality that you get out of the front trunk, clearly that's going to be the Model 3. I will let you decide whether electrification is right for you. Next up, we have the Mercedes-Benz C-Class. This has been completely redesigned recently. It starts around the same, 43550 I do like the base engine in the C-Class a bit more. It has a lot of pep to it. I like the way the interior is laid out as well. I think the interior design is perhaps a bit more to my taste, but iDrive 8, I think, is better than what we find in the Mercedes lineup. It is highly functional, but it is very convoluted as far as its layout goes. It really takes a lot of time to get used to the operation of that software, and I really dislike some of the controls on the steering wheel and the way that it interacts. Roominess-wise, they're pretty equal when it comes to that. Performance, obviously, is quite equal as well, as is handling, and pricing pretty similar as well. We expect the top end C63 to, again, go over about $115,000. So this really just comes down, do you want the BMW or do you want the Mercedes? And I think you could not go wrong with either of these options. 
Next up, we have the Lexus IS, which I think is actually a good example of the difficulty in creating a vehicle that is very well rounded versus one that is laser focused on something specific. The IS definitely has a lower starting price, $40,985, and it goes up to maybe about the mid level of these ranges, up to about $66,500. There are some interesting quirks with the Lexus IS lineup. If you want a naturally aspirated V6, you'll find one of those. If you want a naturally aspirated V8, it's the last one. Now, unfortunately, the reality of having those naturally aspirated engines in the lineup means that no Lexus IS is going to feel as peppy, as quick as certain versions of the 3 Series or the C Class, etc., etc. On the other hand, Lexus is really focused on purity. That may sound weird, but Lexus and Akito Toyota has a real focus on handling refinement, steering feel, etc. If I were to buy a vehicle in this segment simply based on steering and handling feel and that precision on a track, I would buy the Lexus IS. It's going to feel great in the corners. The unfortunate thing is, if the track is big enough, a 3 Series is still going to be faster. And none of us live on a track. Well, I mean, some of you might, but none of the rest of us live on a track. Most of us are just driving the car on your daily commute. And in all of those daily commute situations, the 3 Series just feels better. It has a better infotainment system. It has more comfortable seats. It has easier to use controls. It is a little bit faster as far as 0 to 60 goes. And even though you're going to give up that steering refinement and that handling precision, most people frankly just don't care. Bottom line, this segment is full of one trick and two trick ponies. The Lexus IS is obviously very reliable and has great handling. But the other attributes fall behind the 3 Series and the C Class. The Model 3 is really quick when you get the Model 3 performance. The other versions, there are definitely some other issues that you might be considering, especially if you wanted, I don't know, an instrument cluster right in front of the steering wheel. The Volvo S60 has great fuel economy and great plug in hybrid range, but it's not nearly as much fun as the 3 Series. It does have some pretty comfortable seats. The Infiniti Q50, pretty darn cheap. The Twin Turbo 6 is an awful lot of fun, but it's feeling pretty old. The 3 Series, and actually I would say the C Class as well, definitely rise above the Audi A4, which I think is also well rounded, just not as well rounded as the BMW and Mercedes. So I think it's easy to see why these would be my top two picks in this segment if I'm talking generally. Now, clearly, if you're interested in reliability, there's a vehicle for you. If you want the best fuel economy, there's a different option for you. But the general recommendation for compact luxury stands in America, I think currently has to stand with 3 Series first, C Class a very, very close second. Let me know what you think about all that in the comment section. I'll see all of you later.